We are on and live. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to Matins on this Wednesday of the fifth week in Lent. Thank you for being with me this morning. Our scriptures today are, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 7. Howdy. We're also going to start our journey in 2 Corinthians. Um, we're we're going to start in chapter 2, though, so we'll jump kind of into the past the, the beginning material in that letter. And our psalm for the day is number 99. <clears throat> Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn, and make them our own in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is near to those who call upon him, O come, let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is near to those who call upon him. O come, let us worship him. <coughs> Psalm 99. The Lord is king. Let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. O mighty king, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. Let us pray. Lord our God, King of the universe, you love what is right. Lead us in your righteousness that we may live to praise you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So we're now in Exodus chapter 7. Yesterday we read chapter 5. We're skipping chapter 6, um, which is mostly a, a dialogue between God and Moses. Moses is again, or God is now again telling Moses what he's going to do. And he reminds Moses of his covenant with Abraham. And then we get some genealogy of Moses and Aaron. Um, traced all the way back to Reuben. So, <clears throat> Jacob's son. So then we pick up in chapter 7. And it begins with... Um, it begins with God talking to Moses and telling him to go to Pharaoh. Right and and but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. 
Moses, and then it, it tells us Moses and Aaron went there. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. And that's where today's reading picks up. So Exodus chapter 7, we begin at verse 8. <clears throat> Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts, for each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent, and you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness, but so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn to blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not eat, take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is uh, our, f our first of this lectionary schedule in the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to start in chapter 2 at verse 14. <coughs> St. Paul writes, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you. You yourselves are our letters of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant. 
not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> so God has spent two and a half chapters, I guess, <clears throat> building Moses up for the task he's about to set in front of him. He's been telling him, I'm going to put you in front of Pharaoh, and I'm going to put you in front of my people, God says. Moses is the reluctant servant. He finally gets talked into it after stirring God's anger a little bit for saying no to God. Saying no to God. Hmm. That's not really a <laughs> something you want to make a habit of. <clears throat> not as his faithful servant, anyway. So... Right away, God tells him, look, you're going to go to Pharaoh and he's not going to want to believe you because he doesn't believe in me, God says. So here's what you're going to do. I'm going to show him a little bit of my power through you. You're going to let this staff turn into a serpent. So Moses and Aaron go and do that. Now remember, this is just the beginning of Exodus. And Moses is 80 years old. And he's going to take on the king of Egypt. And his older brother, Aaron, who speaks for him, is 83. Um, so they already have an entire lifetime under their belts before they even start this. So they perform this in front of Pharaoh to show God's power. Pharaoh gets his magicians, his sorcerers, and they perform the same feet um, but I love this um, <laughs> Aaron's staff turned serpent swallowed up their staffs turned serpents <laughs> um, interesting so the magician listen to this note from the study Bible the magicians practice the art of turning snakes into sticks by squeezing the nape of a snake's neck, compelling it to become rigid and appear dead. Here they also turned their sticks into snakes, raising the suspicion that the sticks had only been rigid snakes. These acts could also have been the lying wonders of Satan. And Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs, demonstrating the supremacy of Yahweh over the gods of Egypt. That should have been readily apparent. Hmm. Interesting. So, but Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He would not listen to them, which is what God told them to expect. So, even though it didn't appear to have a positive outcome, it was still in accordance with God's plan and with God's will. The first plague then, water turned to blood, God tells him. Pharaoh's heart still hardened. He refuses to let the people go. So do this. In the morning, go out and do this. You'll find Pharaoh by the water and do what I tell you and the water will turn to blood. And that's exactly what they did and that's exactly what happened. <clears throat> now, the Egyptians, if you know anything about Egyptian gods, they worship creatures as gods. All of their gods have animal heads. There's a a bird head and a cat head and a dog head and you know, a snake head and that animals were part of you know um, part of their um, their mythology. So <clears throat> Moses and Aaron were empowered by God to force the release of Israel by a series of miracles as penalties. This was how they. Um, how they, they would have seen this, um, these acts. And we only read about the first one today. Tomorrow will be the second plague, but the first one is all we get. Um, this is to prove, you know, and each one gets a little bit worse. It's progressively worse and worse and worse. Um, and it shows that the Lord is the Lord of both heaven and earth and that he has power over all of creation. Um, 
he has supreme omnipotence, I guess is one way to put it. So <coughs> Pharaoh has a daily ritual he does, and God is going to use Aaron and Moses to take advantage of his routine and demonstrate his power. So All right. Sorry, I lost my place. Thus says the Lord, this is verse 17, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn to blood. All right. Now, Moses and Aaron are God's servants, right? When he says, the staff that is in my hand... Remember, that's God speaking, right? It's not physically in God's hand. It's in Aaron's hand. But Aaron is God's servant. So Aaron and Moses are God's servants, God's hand, right? Um, Moses gives us a historical description of God miraculously changing the water of the Nile into actual blood. Moses frequently uses the Hebrew word for blood, and always in a literal sense, never figuratively. Denying that the Nile turned into blood opens the door to denying that Jesus changed water into wine. So it was actual blood. It wasn't just red colored water. That's the point. <clears throat> all right. So the Nile and all, of the, all the water that feeds into it, all of it turned to blood and that caused the fish to die, the river to stink wasn't drinkable so um and it and i hope you heard it say even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone so buckets and cups and all the water in egypt would have turned to blood which would have said this was more than just a natural occurring event this was something supernatural and they did it in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. He lifted up the staff, struck the water. All the water turned to blood. The fish died. The Nile stank. The Egyptians couldn't drink it. There was blood throughout all the land. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts. All right. Seeing that um, the river turned to blood and all the dead fish, the Egyptians may have concluded that Israel's God had slain Hapi, H-A-P-I, the Nile God, believed to be the giver of life and sustenance. It could have believed that. We're not sure. Um, there's different ways that the pagans would have, the pagan Egyptians would have interpreted this act. Um, the magician, magicians would have plied their arts on the water that was unaffected. So there must have been a little bit of water they could have done this to. Or wait a little bit and the water that was coming from outside of Egypt to feed into the Nile would have been clear. Mm. But they would have done it. Um, and they thought, well, my magicians can do it too. So Pharaoh didn't listen. Once again, he turned one into his ho house and did not take even this to heart. He was still hardened. And it was a hardening against the basic needs of his own people because now his people didn't have water to drink. That's not good. The next verse actually says, and we'll read this tomorrow, seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. So it doesn't say how long the, the water was blood or undrinkable, but more than a day or two is a real hardship. Okay. <clears throat> Fresh water could be found when wells were dug. That's the only way they could get it. They could not get it from the, from the river. The Nile River was everything to the Egyptians. It was the source of their welfare, their everything. It was the center of their, of their livelihood. So, all right, let's move to 2 Corinthians. So we skip chapter 1, um, which talks a good bit about why Paul is writing to them. They're still division in the church. Um, 
the earlier part of chapter two talks about forgiving the sinner, and then he moves into this section called Triumph in Christ. Christ, God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Palm Sunday is coming up, right? Um, all right, and it takes us here to a note on Colossians chapter two. Let's just check that out real fast. Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter two, verse 15, which says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Rulers and authorities are created by God and yet corrupted by sin. Is this the right reference? Yeah. Okay. Paul had in mind the Roman custom of stripping defeated armies of weapons and armor and parading them in a triumphal procession. Christians should not allow these rulers either to tempt or threaten them. All right. Triumphal procession. Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. He is the victor. We know that he wins. And through us, his followers, his carriers of the gospel, spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. All right. Fragrance. All right. Temple sacrifices produced smells that we would associate with grilling meat or cooking bread. The pleasing aroma of Christ's sacrifice on the cross covers the stench of our sin. I don't know that I've ever thought about that in terms of sense of smell. Mm. <clears throat> we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Okay. One to one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Okay. So we got a contrast here. Now which is which? Death to death. To focus on the deadly character of a sacrifice or triumphal military procession is to fail to see how that sacrifice gives life. But Paul's life of sacrifice brings life to unbelievers. That's how that he Paul's Paul has given up much for the gospel. And that is how he is sharing this with those who don't believe and bringing them to Christ, giving them that eternal life that God has promised all who believe in him. There's the life that it gives. Who is sufficient for these things? Hmm. Paul personally felt like he was inadequate for the monumental task of apostolic ministry. Being Christ's representative, preaching both judgment and forgiveness in Christ's name. Whew, that resonates with me. <laughs> this did not destroy his confidence in Christ and the certainty of his calling in Christ's name. It was not him, it was Christ in him and through him that did all this. We are not like so many peddlers of God's word, those who peddle God's word for personal profit. Think the millionaire televangelists who preach a twisted version of the gospel and do so to enrich themselves. Mm, I better stop. I'll just leave it at that. You know who I'm talking about. Um, he might also be differentiating his gathering of the offerings for the saints. We are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ, accountable to the purpose and assurance of Christ and his message. If you carry God's word, you have to know and understand that you are also measured by God's word more precisely and more strictly than anyone else. It can be daunting at times. I 
Please believe me on that. And that ends chapter 2 and begins chapter 3. And this chapter is titled Ministers of the New Covenant. And he starts with, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? In other words, Paul has no need to establish his credibility with the Corinthians. His authority comes from Christ's commission, which he received in, a, in Acts chapter 9. Christ called him. His credibility comes from Christ, not from the church. The church that he established in Christ's name, by the way. <coughs> Businessmen or officials often sent authorizing letters on behalf of their messengers. Is this what they're looking for? The Corinthians knew Paul intimately, so he had no need of any affirmation of his authority. That didn't have to be backed up by anything. Just as Christ's message needs no human authority. But if you remember, Paul talks about people that he calls super apostles who were false teachers. They may have used letters like that to pretend that they had more authority than Paul. So rather than debate the issue of his ministry's authorization, Paul declares that the Corinthians are the proof of his ministry, right? You yourselves are our letters of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. As believers in Christ living in faith, they were the greatest earthly commendation for the integrity and sincerity of Paul's work. Paul's work bore fruit. That fruit was them. Corinthians mutually encourage one another and witness to the whole of Corinth as a result of Paul's ministry among them. You show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. You are. Written not with ink on paper, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Here is where the gospel lies. Paul's ministry to them was first and foremost a work of the Holy Spirit. If it was not the Holy Spirit, it would not have su succeeded. There's confidence and enduring assurance in this letter that he's talking about, written by the Holy Spirit on their hearts. Um, the living God, of course, refers to the Father. Such is the confidence that we have the, through Christ toward God. Hmm. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. The gospel was not only the proclamation of his ministry, but its power also. God, out of his infinite goodness and mercy, comes to us first. He causes his gospel to be preached. The Holy Spirit desires to work and accomplish this conversion and renewal in us. This is from the Formula of Concord, out of the, the Lutheran Confessions. Not that we are sufficient. They are glorifying God and that it is God's work and they are merely his servants and his instrument. Our sufficiency is from God who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. Right? God makes us competent. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Right? So if you feel called by God to do something, trust and believe that he will equip you. You may not know that you are. You may not be yet. God will equip you. You just need to know and feel that you are called. That's the message here. <coughs> For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. All right. The letter of the law, which is holy and powerful, puts the sinner to death. That's what it does. It tells us that we are condemned. That's what the law's job is. The law is a ministry that kills through the letter and preaches condemnation. 
But the Spirit gives life. God works in our hearts through the promises of the gospel of Jesus to bring life and salvation. Once the law convicts us and tells us that we are dead in our sin, the gospel comes behind and says, but <laughs> you do have a savior. The law told you you needed a savior and the good news is that you have one and he has saved you. Law and gospel, you cannot have one without the other. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, what's he talking about? The law. Carved in letters on stone, Ten Commandments, right? The law of Moses is defined by its function in the lives of sinful people, which we all are. God's holiness exposes our sinfulness. It damns any notion of self-sufficiency outside of God's grace. I've gone too far. That's tomorrow's reading. So the letter kills, the Spirit gives life. The law tells us that we are dead in our sin. The Holy Spirit brings us the gospel, reminds us of our salvation, and tells us that the Savior that we need, we do have. All right. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Let us conclude our liturgy, shall we? <clears throat> In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Let justice roll down like water, and righteousness like an overflowing stream. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an overflowing stream. Let us pray. Father of mercy, hear the prayers of your repentant children who call on you in love, enlighten our minds, and sanctify our hearts. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O oh Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Give me the joy of your saving help again and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let my mouth be full of your praise and your glory all the day long. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He redeems my life from the grave and crowns me with mercy and loving kindness. Lord, hear my prayer. 
and let my cry come before you. Let's pray. O Lord, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity, and in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. That concludes our matins for this Wednesday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. Thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Um, matins again tomorrow. So hope you can be with me for that. Um, but until we can be together again, whenever that is, tomorrow or another time, may God bless and keep you.